Um, hello everyone and welcome to the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Um, today's topic is, my, my name is Sanya Iguman and I'm the coordinator for the, of the laboratory for uh, theory, creation and politics of space. Um, today's topic is technology as fictional surrealism. We will speak about dreams and reality, about surrealism practices and minds that are capable of experiencing them as such. We will put in the juxtaposition the fiction and reality in which technology can be understood as a field within which it is possible to compare and even connect these different conceptions. Does fiction then become a mechanism of surrealism? How does fiction enable the surreal? Is this connection even possible? The relation that emerge in these questions can be seen as crucial for thinking about technology since they reconstruct the problem of the mind in the production of something genuinely new. The inspiration for this topic came from two lives, the, the one of Leonardo da Vinci and Nikola Tesla, that will be presented by Alexander Neuvel and Branimir Jovanovic, two scholars who devoted their entire careers to these two geniuses. Alexander is an architect and a professional in the field of design and communication. For more than 25 years, he has been working with the Leonardo Museum in Vinci, Toscana, Tos Tuscany, for the creation of scientific and historical contents. He has designed and contributed to the creation of exhibitions, multimedia itineraries, and sections of Leonardo's exhibitions all over Europe. He is an active promoter of the use of three-dimensional reconstruction techniques as historical scientific research means. Branimir dedicated almost the entire career to understanding the personality and work of Nikola Tesla, which can be understood from the numerous scientific publications. Um, he graduated from the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering in Belgrade with the topic Tesla's contribution to the development of aviation. He received his MA degree at the Faculty of Philosophy in Zagreb in the field of history and philosophy of science on Tesla's mechanical oscillators and his doctorate degree at his home faculty in Belgrade with the topic Tesla's contribution to research methodology in mechanical engineering. Since 2019, he has been the president of the Nikola Tesla Foundation founded in New York and based in Miami. And uh, the idea uh, for uh, this exchange of thoughts and the potential collaboration was born in Italy on a tiny remote volcano island, Stromboli, <laughs> when I brought a gift to Alexander, a book about Nikola Tesla. Uh, so please. Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, it's uh, very stimulating for me trying to uh, to get a bit in deep and uh, themes which are typical for my work. But I, I'm really really curious what uh, philosophers can add to what for me is uh, my uh, daily work. So the provocation launched by this seminar in, is that in fact technology falls into the field of fiction, constructive knowledge, that is a, a fabrication which, however ingenious, does not have in itself the seed of dreams of the unconscious with all its generative power. All the systems we use today to generate innovation in the field of engineering, for example, are based on iterative processes, processes applied to large databases, uh, such as pa patent databases, uh, from which, uh, through deterministic methodologies, uh, new solutions are sought. But what happens where some kind of technological thinking goes beyond what is known and possible? Uh, it's, well, uh, it's, it's not working. Why? Oh, okay. Just one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, maybe we can uh, push the provocation just a little bit further. We have the current examples of uh, science fiction and uh, past examples uh, of artistic and thought, and thought movements uh, such as futurism. Can this be related to our theme of today? Can a vision projected in the future in technology and therefore uh, concrete, at least uh, narrative, represent a bridge, a sort of hybrid between rational and deterministic thinking, which is linked to the concept of fabrication, and dreamlike thinking linked to the subconscious. In my opinion, all this is deeply connected with the theme of the so-called creative mind, 
the one that intervenes in the processes of artistic innovation. What elements does a creative mind use to generate something new? And if the elements it uses are technological elements, what is the result? And if the process could be pushed even further, combining the real technological world with unreal elements, perhaps futuristic but plausible, what do we get? Are these just science fiction productions? Perhaps, on closer inspection, it is not only science fiction that can afford to look beyond the real technological world to a not too different type of creativity, perhaps, owe, owe the extraordinary results, minds that have given the world material to dream about for centuries. If, therefore, this may be the case, then Leonardo da Vinci and Nikola Tesla have certainly been emblematic of this point of view. In order to frame Leonardo, which uh, it is my duty to speak about today, in our reasoning, it is important to keep two things in mind. The first, the first is uh, uh, that, uh, as it's known, uh, he was certainly an engineer, but above all, an artist of excellent level. He was essentially paid uh, during his lifetime as an artist, mainly a painter. The second thing connected to the first is that Leonardo perhaps never actually built anything of what he designed. Contrary to what is true for all his fellow engineers of the time, for Leonardo there are no documents, testimonies, assignments, payments or anything else that ascertain the construction of any of his machines. There are reasonable traces uh, that he may have built models of some of the machines but nothing more. Therefore, understanding Leonardo's mind is very complex, even if only briefly. We have over 7,000 handwritten pages by him, most of which contain dozens of different themes mixed together, both in drawn and written form. What are commonly called Leonardo's codes are in reality notebooks, on which he constantly took notes of a completely disorganized nature. Nothing to do with the treaties of other authors of his time. It, um, it is on this type of material, extremely dispersive, therefore, that we must work to reconstruct Leonardo's thoughts. The task is obviously extremely complex, as well, uh, as well as controversial, in the sense that many times on the same theme, returning to it after some time, often many years, Leonardo changes his mind, sometimes even radically. Despite this, uh, much can be said, and there are many different examples that I could give to contribute to today's uh, reflection. I have therefore chosen a short path that is div divided into three steps. The first is a brief summary of what Leonardo means for the history of technology, for that of this time in particular, but not only. The second step is an example of how Leonardo has an engineering mind, just as we could understand it today in addition to the well-known artistic one. With the third and the last step, I will try to show you how these two souls of Leonardo converge uh, when he put into play all his skills and uh, all his instinctive impulses to face his greatest dream, human flight. So, I want to start by introducing you to Leonardo as we understand him when we study him as an engineer of the Renaissance. To do this, I chose an aspect as banal as it is striking, drawing. Of course, Leonardo is a great artist, so drawing techniques are completely familiar tools for him, unlike that was for many of his fellow engineers. But it's not just about that. We can get an idea of what was technical representation before Leonardo by observing, for example, those that are drawings of some of his illustrious predecessors such as uh, Villard de Roncourt, or uh, Guido da Vigevano, or uh, Conrad Kieser, or Mariano Di Jacopo, known as Il Taccola, who was a, a good uh, friend of uh, Brunelleschi, for who of you well, uh, was yesterday our discussion of Brunelleschi. Apart from the fact that they 
obviously failed to master the techniques of drawing, and in particular those of axonometric and perspective representation, the low complexity of the devices portrayed in this treatise, and approximation, sometimes very rough, of the technological content, place these treatises all in the same category of precursors. One of Leonardo's masters, not because they had the opportunity to collaborate, but because Leonardo studied his treatises. There's a, a really nice treatise in, uh, which is preserved in uh, uh, Biblioteca Laurenziana in Florence, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which contains uh, handwritten notes in the side by Leonardo when he was studying it. Uh, this Francesco Di Giordo Martini was an engineer from the city of Siena whose technical skills made him a highly respected consultant disputed be between the courts of the time. His representation of machines, although they are very, still very simple devices, denote a certain capacity of abstraction in the design of relatively complex devices and a technique of representation more schematic than really design, denoting a first step in the direction of a real abstraction. Leonardo da Vinci, in this respect, is an absolute game changer. This is one of Leonardo's most famous technological drawings. The ability to represent a device in this way, in a complex view composed by an assembly, an exploded view, and a constructive detail, denote at the same time a perfect mastery of the technological idea that, under that underlies the device mediated by a practical knowledge of the device itself and a capacity to abstract the operating principle of the same, such as to make possible the projection of the object in a substantially mental space. The second step I was talking about is a brief demonstration of how Leonardo is very clear about the evolution path of an idea and how for him innovation is a real engineering process. Leonardo da Vinci was, in fact, in general, a precursor of scientific research, anticipating some aspects of Galileo's scientific method, affirming the importance of empirical experimentation and mathematical demonstration. He used the drawing to explain the mechanisms underlying the phenomena he observed, and was able to link science and technology, rejecting both general metaphysical explanations and the recourse to the principle of authority not based on experience. On this, we could open uh, a very interesting discussion with uh, our colleagues philosophers, but for the moment, let us return to the example. This consists in a problem of optimization of the techniques of excavation of canals, works that at the, very, uh, at the time were very important and very expensive in terms of time, money, and human lives. It is in fact a matter on, uh, to which Leonardo returns many times over the years, evidently solicited by his patrons. In this specific case, it is the optimization of a large excavation machine. Yeah. During the works for the excavation of the harbor canal of the town of Cesenatico, which is uh, in the, on the Adriatic Sea, uh, uh, at the, uh, at the latitude of Zadar. Uh, Leonardo was able to examine a large machine that was used to transport out of the canal the material excavated by hand by the workers. Leonardo analyzes the machine, identifies a long series of defects and presents its own alternative, which in his view offers countless improvements. And this is it. To present to his patron, he prepares a drawing where he depicts the two machines at work in the same canal. <clears throat> on the left, the traditional one, and on the right, his proposal. It is not useful for us now to analyze in detail all the technical issues, including the many unresolved that Leonardo intends to address with his project. It is certainly interesting instead to try to recognize the lines of development that Leonardo has followed thinking of wanting to improve the efficiency of this machine, showing how it is a real evolutionary process. We Florentines like to say that Leonardo da Vinci's home is Florence, which of course in some ways is true. It is in Florence that he trained and started working. But to tell the truth, very soon the hyper-competitive environment in Florence at the time began to suffocate the young Leonardo 
focus more on developing new ideas, both in the artistic and technical fields, rather than looking for orders and closing them as soon as possible to earn more. For this reason, he soon moved to the Sforza court in Milan, where the artists were kept in, um, in a sort of protective environment at the court, uh, which best suited the thousand interests of the young Leonardo. Much of his working and artistic life, therefore, Leonardo spent in Milan, not in Florence. And just in Milan at the time, works was underway for the excavation of imposing canals that are still in use today in the region. On these sites, he was able to see at work the machines that at the time were used for this type of, of works. He drew them and began to think about them. Through his notes and drawings, it is possible to follow over the years the evolution of his thoughts on the subject. The first and most obvious of the transformations that Leonardo thinks can be useful to improve the efficiency of the machine is to double it, a single frame used to accommodate two moving elements that can work independently on each other. The second issue is mobility. These heavy cranes had to be moved as the excavation front of the canal advanced, which often meant having to disassemble them and then reassemble them in a new position. Leonardo studies the way to insert wheels to make the machine mobile. The shape of the crane also evolves, uh, trying to free it <clears throat> from the support of the edges of the canal. And uh, the machine are becoming more and more complex with multiple wheels and more arms independent of each other. These are studies on the movement of the arms to allow them to cover as wide as an area as possible. All these same reflections are concentrated in Leonardo's proposal for the, uh, for the improvement of the Cesenatico machine. And this is the final transformation. On the right, you can clearly see the cubic shape uh, of the original machine that turns in the final triangular shape. As a further demonstration of the fact that such a, process, uh, such a process is evolutionary, it is interesting to note that this is not the only case in which Leonardo applies these exact same ideas to an excavating machine. About 15 years earlier, in fact, Leonardo drew a pair of cranes just on the two sides of the same sheet. The first has only one arm and has a fixed base. The second is the twin of the first, except for the fact that the arms have become two and the base has become mobile. The same transformation introduced on the large crane we talked about, but elaborated 15 years earlier. Oh, sorry, this is not what I intended to show. The concluding example, uh, which in my view represents a synthesis of Leonardo's two approaches to innovative thinking, as I have anticipated, concerns the dream of mechanical flight. Flight is an idea that Leonardo developed through, uh, throughout his entire life, uh, and I really like to present it as a paradigm of the evolution of Leonardo's thoughts over the years. As in other areas, Leonardo passes from a first youthful phase in which he is convinced of man's ability to overcome his limits thanks to knowledge and technology, to a more mature phase of his thought in which many other factors come into play, one of which is observation of nature. The first drawings of flying machines portray devices in which mechanics are completely protagonists. Although uh, this early machine mimicked the shape of birds uh, or other flying animals, they are actually machines uh, with very basic movements. Uh, oops. It's stuck in there. Why? Why is it? Oh, now it goes. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Probably, in fact, Leonardo initially dealt with machines uh, with wings uh, in theaters. He was often hired as a set designer. The fact that the wings of this machine are often moved by screws, therefore, 
with very slow movements uh, seem to be completely in agreement uh, with this possibility. You see here some of these mechanisms. Soon, uh, his machines began to evolve, at, the, at first for completely technical reasons. <clears throat> An example is that of uh, the flapping of wings. During flight, birds change the geometry of their wings uh, uh, when they rise and then lower them, so as to push down maximally and minimize air resistance uh, when rising them. Initially, Leonardo thought of wings that could be only crossed by air in one direction with doors that open and close like valves. This idea is progressively abandoned. You see here some more examples. Um, the idea is, is progressively abandoned to give way to more complex machines that instead modify the geometry of the wings when they move, just as birds do. As the idea of actual flight made its way into Leonardo's mind, and the machines he designed had increasingly complex structures, Leonardo began to see the matter from a, a somewhat more general point of view. The first question that arises is whether or not human musculature develops enough power to lift itself and a flying machine into the air. At the same time, his careful observations of nature led him to reflect on the possibility of imitating flying animals in a more refined way, not simply replicating their appearance. To do this, he investigates the anatomy of these animals. And it's, it, it is uh, certainly no coincidence uh, that his drawing of structures for flying machines' wings increasingly imitate the anatomy of birds, increasingly ideal structures which clash with the actual possibility of realizing them at the time. Leonardo is in fact increasingly aware of the fact that human musculature is not powerful enough for flight and also that the materials at his disposal do not have the necessary strength and lightness. But this does not prevent Leonardo from continuing to think in extremely concrete terms about the problem of flight. His vision goes beyond the difficulties he faces and that perhaps he considers insurmountable. A first example of how this two consciousness coexist in Leonardo is the parachute. It is a small drawing in which he imagines this pyramidal pavilion held open by a central pole, like an umbrella, since the heights from which he could have imagined launching himself could at most be those of a tower. So the parachute should have already been opened at the time of launch. There would not have been enough time, in fact, for a closed parachute to open, as modern parachutes designed for jumping uh, from greatest heights do. This kind of very practical approach is also find, uh, found in uh, some Leonardo's predecessors as well as in those who followed him. This is Fausto Veranzio, a Dalmatian from Sibenik, a Venetian city at the time. But looking at the drawing, it is easy to suspect uh, that may have been an inspiration from nature, for example, with dandelion seeds. The inspiration of nature is perhaps also evident in other projects, such as the completely unrealistic one of the flying sphere. It is a spherical sail placed on top, which uh, uh, placed on top of a mountain would have been carried away by the wind uh, with a passenger in the center. Leonardo takes care of him in a very practical way too. The housing in the center is automatically always straight uh, um, as in the suspension mechanism of a compass. Here, the inspiration could be that of thistle seeds. The most plausible flying machine Leonardo ever conceived is basically our hang glider. This drawing precisely describes the characteristics of the gliding sail controlled by a system of tie rods in a manner really similar to what happens in modern hang gliders. And even here, maybe, okay. 
it is not to, under, to be uh, underestimated the possibility that uh, it may have been inspired by nature, in this case, perhaps, perhaps in, by linden seeds. The period of definitive abandonment of the idea of flapping wing flight in Leonardo con coincides with the design of very complex machines that represent the desperate attempt to exploit uh, to the extreme human muscles, including, for example, those of the neck pushing with the head. But despite Leonardo's lack of belief in a concrete possibility of flapping wing flight, he nevertheless pays attention to many details of this machine as if they could actually fly. An example of this uh, is the design of what we now call landing gears. <clears throat> In some cases, designed up to a truly remarkable level of detail, including, for example, shock absorbers. Being aware of the impossibility of achieving something but keeping studying it to develop all its details as if it were achievable. After all, the difference between a many conviction and a far-sighted vision of the future can only be discovered in the light of the following history. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, very much. And now I give a word to Branimir. Thank you. So, first of all, Sanya, thank you for this invitation and thank you to your institute. Uh, it was a really quite a challenge for me because you have heard I, I have technical background and uh, uh, it is not easy at all to talk about uh, Tesla in the context of the art. But uh, to talk about Tesla in the context of surrealism was quite a challenge for me. But uh, uh, I don't know, do you know, this initiative actually came out from another initiative, Sanya, to put Alex and me together to try to build the context for Leonardo and Tesla together. It's a really very interesting uh, uh, task. Uh, we are now communicating and trying to develop something which maybe someday can, uh, can be one good exhibition here in Belgrade or in Italy, whenever, you know. So uh, uh, talking about uh, Tesla and art or putting Tesla in context of the art or culture is not a uh, new topic to me. And uh, uh, it, 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 it was not new uh, topic to uh, uh, at, uh, at all because uh, a lot of Tesla's uh, friends, artists, uh, uh, novelists, poets, uh, painters, uh, they noticed this artistic side of Tesla's personality and Tesla creative process. So uh, for the beginning, I will like to <laughs> read to you and uh, to show you this one. OK, I don't uh, know, do you see, but I will read it to you. This is uh, what Tesla's friend, the novelist and journalist Julian Hawthorne uh, wrote to Tesla in one letter in 1912. You seem to prefer to restrict your creations to the spiritual plane. You do not descend to cast them in a matter. You lead the mind forward to the point where the next step could be tangible achievements, magnificent for materialists. There you turn away, carelessly as it were, and proceed unhampered to challenge the gates of other mysteries. This is the way of poet. Your whole work is poetry but differs from what goes under the name in be, being winged with actual certain facts, not the mere hope of coming mastery of nature, but the certainty of it. So, uh, so far as I know, no one so far uh, developed this topic, you know, or research uh, precisely what is the relationship between the uh, Tesla and art and uh, for me, when Sanya invited me to think about some presentation uh, to put Tesla in the context of surrealism, uh, I believe that uh, uh, it is appropriate to consider surrealism as a technique of using subconscious technique content in the creative process. And then Tesla's inventive method uh, can be very, very interesting for discussion. 
And there is another interesting example of Tesla surrealistic concept for the surreal technology of the future that I will discuss later on. This is the Tesla's project of worldwide wireless transmission of energy. So, uh, I believe that it is not likely for us to understand deeper a relationship between the art and science, and especially a relationship uh, between or, or the role of the art in the scientific creative process. If uh, we, uh, uh, within the contemporary meaning of the terms art, technique, technology, I believe that we have to go back to history to research and understand what are the original meanings of the terms. Why? Because last 100, 200, maybe 300 years ago, basic terms, art, culture, science, technology, are narrow. You know? So what we consider today as art is not the same as what is considered 2,500 years ago. Example. So let's go back in the history and uh, uh, what we can notice that ancient Greeks didn't have the concept of the art. It's very interesting. They, they have the term techne that refer or making or doing. And it was always used with another term, episteme, which means knowledge, understanding, principles. You know. So ancient Greeks used techne when they want to describe painting or any skillful art. You know. So techne is a kind of embryo for not only technique and technology, but for the art too. It's very interesting. Uh, in, uh, observation because uh, you know we are now considering technology and techniques something which is totally different from the art uh, so terms art craft technique technology they were socially constructed at a certain period of history so i believe that uh, also our language is very interesting uh, uh, I will especially uh, explain it to our Italian friends, you know. In, uh, in Serbian language, uh, all basic words for mind, episteme, invent, invention, skill, and art have the same root, which is mind. We say in uh, Serbian, um. Mm -hmm. So we say for mind, we say um. For know-how or episteme, we, we say umeti. For invent, izumeti. For skill umeće for the art umetnost you know so all the all the uh, we, we have the one word which is the uh, rooted into the all these basic words so for me uh, it's very interesting to uh, uh, observe that uh, i i find somewhere that uh, one definition that art is the art is the highest level of a skill it's very interesting you know why because there is something inside of the artist, inside of the person who has the, some creative process, you know? And this is, uh, uh, this can be under our control to somehow uh, learn skill, to master some kind of skill. But then when we go to a certain point, to a certain level, then there is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, connection between the, inner energy or inner force and something which comes out of us, which is out of our control. So this is some kind of the connection between the art, between the skill or craft and something which we frequently call, call inspiration. You know? This is uh, what we can observe very frequently in Tesla's case. You know, I will later I will tell you uh, more about this example, but he was 26 years young when he, for the first time, as he said, felt the power of the ideas. The, when he discovered the rotating magnetic field, which actually changed the uh, appearance of the modern society, in a sense, this uh, uh, invention uh, was uh, the base for his 36 patents, which was later on uh, in, in the United States, uh, it was acquired or bought uh, by the George Westinghouse and transfer into the technology which they are using. Okay. 
But the moment he discovered it, you know, it's very interesting because he had a five years period of incubation. You know? For five years, he was trying to solve something which his professors of uh, electrotechnic told him it's possible. You know? But he was very stubborn, you know, and he concentrated and focused uh, this idea. We also have one uh, interesting word in Serbian uh, for focus. We say, usred sred. That means uh, that uh, we are going into the middle of the problem and then into the middle of the middle. Usred sred. Usred sred is focus. So he focused himself for five years, trying to expel from his mind everything else, just to focus to this idea. So he, he, he got ill um, uh, at the end of this. Uh, he had a nervous breakdown at the end of this period. And after that, when he recovered, he had a flashes of images. Just something comes, nobody knows where. So this is this moment of you know internal effort and something which come out as a, as a support, spiritual support. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Plato saw art as imitation, mimesis. But for Aristotle, art was a way of representing the inner significance of something. Uh, aesthetic was important for both, for Plato and Aristotle, and they agreed that the art objects should try to be both beautiful and useful. This is the also moment which I recognize in Tesla's case, you know. For example, there are, uh, for the moment, uh, uh, Alex, you had the one picture of Tesla's machine in yeah. your presentation, uh, uh, which is done in the, uh, the uh, technique of uh, American retouch, how do you say? Uh, uh, I don't know how do you say it in English. Uh, American technology of uh, making photos colored, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, it seems that Tesla uh, so much loved his own inventions, you know? He would like to see beautiful pictures of his machines, you know? So this aesthetic moment was, uh, mm -hmm. for Tesla was also so very important. And uh, uh, Aristotle had the theory of four causes, idea, material, process, and telos, which we can uh, follow later on in the Renaissance and even to the late 19th century. So we can also notice this kind of uh, approach in Tesla's case. Uh, if you're talking about uh, the... the, the, the uh -huh, sorry, I forgot. If you are talking about the, uh, the, the, the Tesla's projects, you know, the name he was, uh, the names he was given to, 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 to his project, we can notice, for example, one name of his project was the art of telemechanics, another name, the art of teleautomatics, another name, the art of telegeodynamics. This was all new, <coughs> new technologies which, which he developed, you know? The new art of projecting non-dispersive energy through natural media. This is what uh, popular journalists at his time called that race, you know. But why he all the times mentioned the art of this, the art of this? Uh, somehow it was usual in the times, but uh, this is also these names actually connected, uh, you know, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, approach of all Greeks with actually uh, Tesla's own approach to, to methodology of his own work, you know. So I would also like to share with you a few, few moments from Tesla's, uh, uh, from, uh, from Tesla's uh, creative process moment which I uh, designated that as artistic, uh, aesthetic, or uh, surrealist. For example, in his speech of, uh, uh, on, the, on the occasion of opening of uh, Hydroplant and Niagara, Tesla said, it was a happy day for the mass of humanity when the artist felt the desire of becoming a physician, an electrician, an engineer, or, or mechani mechanician, or what not, a mathematician or a financer, 
for it was he who wrought all these wonders and grandeur we are witnessing. It was he who abolished small, pedantic, narrow groove school teaching, which made of an aspiring student a gaily slave. And he who allowed freedom in the choice of subject of study according to one's pleasure and inclination, and so facilitated development. You know, it's very interesting uh, in a moment uh, I never, you know, uh, find uh, in the literature. You know, uh, very frequently I saw the situation when engineer or uh, man or, or person from the technology uh, wants to become the artist, you know, and make this kind of transition. But what he was, he was talking, uh, when artists want to become the engineer, that's something, you know. This is the, you know, you must understand this is the end of the 19th century. At that time, Tesla uh, said, I didn't, uh, later on, I didn't know in what direction civilization would go, in the direction of artistic or scientific. And later on, he realized that we are going in one uh, uh, scientific, technological uh, direction, you know. Uh, another moment which I I uh, like very much, this is the part from his Colorado Springs diary, uh, beautiful descriptions of the clouds there we can find, so just to, to read to you. A very curious phenomenon is the rapid formation and the disappearance of the clouds. One can watch them continuously forming and disappearing rapidly, and one merely needs to turn away for a new, for a few moments when he may see that the that the aspect has changed, new clouds having replaced those he saw before. On many occasions, just after sunset, I have seen seemingly dense white clouds appear as by enhancement below the mountain peaks. So quickly these, uh, did these clouds or mist form that their appearance was much like the projection of an image or the screen. The wonderful beauty of the cloud formations as seen here is, however, enhanced not only by the incredible sharpness of the outlines and vividness of color, but also by their accidental arrangement and forms they assume. So Tesla also, as I said before, just want to, to prove to you with this uh, small passage, was uh, believed that it is very interesting that uh, what he is doing, that beauty is an important part of his creative uh, process. And now we come to moment which we can maybe recognize as surrealistic moments in his great process. So Tesla, yes, thank you. So Tesla wrote in my inventions, I was about 17 when my thoughts turned seriously to invention. Then I observed to my delight that I could visualize with the greatest facility. I needed no models, drawings, or experiments. I could picture them all as real in my mind. Thus, I have been led unconsciously to evolve what I consider a new method of materializing, inventing concept, concepts and ideas, which is uh, readily opposite to the purely experimental and is, in my opinion, ever so much more expeditious and efficient. What he was talking about is uh, in, uh, his methodology, uh, which he was very aware during the years and which he explained as uh, uh, combined process of uh, visualizing things and uh, putting the, the idea which he visualized to develop in his subconscious. This is very similar to, 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 to as far as I understand, surrealistic, uh, using of surrealistic method in, in, in artistic uh, creative process, what, uh, been, what has been used by, by painters or by uh, artists, you know. So uh, I wouldn't uh, talk too much about this aspect of Tesla's work, uh, and I would like to to tell you more about uh, about one example of Tesla's work in uh, in uh, technology. But uh, I just want to tell you that I was uh, inspired by Darius Prokopovich' question or words, uh, which I find. Uh, during my research, uh, you know, in what appropriate context I can put Tesla's work. He said, what currently recognizes surrealistic technologies, if it were real, could they solve key global problems of humanity? 
And it comes to my mind, you know, that uh, uh, Tesla's wireless transmission of energy pro project was actually perfect, perfect pre uh, example for this, you know. What is it about? And just to tell you shortly that uh, uh, Tesla was inspired from uh, 1892 by the English scientist after his famous lecture in London, you know, that uh, he told them that uh, there are many talented scientists all over the world, which can solve many problems, you know, which confronted with humanity. But Tesla possessed rare talent, which can be used to go to, to, to solve some very, very deep mysteries. So tell, uh, Tesla was puzzled at that time by these, uh, you know, uh, remarks given to him by the English scientist, Lord Kelvin, Lord Ayrton, many others. And he started to think how he can solve the biggest problem of humanity, not only the world wireless transmission of the signals, inputs, but also the world wireless uh, transmission of energy. You know? So uh, in Nikola Tesla Museum, we have really treasure with more than 160,000 original documents. You know? And I believe this piece of paper I'm showing you here is the most valuable document. It is written early in the morning, uh, uh, July 4th, uh, 1899. And uh, it is the first class scientific witness about one extraordinary, very rare and very deep invention Tesla made night before. What happened actually? Uh, a big storm passed over the Colorado Springs where Tesla had his small laboratory with very big coil of 12 million volts, you know. And there he had very sensitive equipment for measuring uh, electrical impulses into the ground, into the earth, you know. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, thunders uh, and uh, uh, electrical strike was over the laboratory. And he noticed some kind of uh, electrical disturbances inside the ground. But after an, one hour, storm passed you know, a few ten, 10 kilometers away. And uh, he noticed again the impulses, electrical impulses in the ground. He observed it with his, this uh, very sensitive equipment. So he asked uh, himself, what's happening? Storm is not about the laboratory, but something uh, is happening inside of the earth, you know. And after one hour, he observed another impulses. And after a whole night in the regular interval, he observed electrical so he said, it must be the stationary waves. So what happened actually? The, this lightning uh, struck the ground and uh, under the certain frequency, you know, and stationary wave is formed in, into the earth and uh, the impulse came back after some time, he observed it. So all the night he has the, this kind of a waves. So he said to himself, if this is the case, then this is a Tesla coil. And this is the, actually, uh, you can see here the, the hydraulical analogy. Tesla explained what he had uh, uh, discovered uh, uh, that night, you know. On the right side, there is a, uh, earth and on the left side, you have the one rubber ball. So he tried to explain what, 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 what actually happened. He knew at that time, as scientists knew, that the Earth is full of electricity. But this elect uh, electricity is some kind of chaotic state, you know. So uh, when he observed these stationary waves, he understand that under the certain uh, conditions, he can transform this static state of electricity inside of the Earth in the some kind of dynamic form. This is the same as, for example, you have the rubber ball, why the rubber? It's important that this envelope to be elastic, you know? What, what makes uh, the earth to be, to have the elastic envelope? This is the system of uh, uh, surface, atmosphere, and ionosphere, you know? This is this kind of elastic, uh, you know, uh, envelope around the earth in the electrical sense. But he said, if we have the rubber ball and we have the pump, and if we uh, 
push this uh, piston on the pump, you know, we will create the wave inside. This is similar as when kids are playing with the water inside of the vessel, you know, and make a move and make a wave, way to come back and make another wave. They are reasonably actually pumping. What's happened? The uh, waves will be bigger and bigger, and in one moment, the wave will come out of that, you know. The similar happens with this uh, rubber ball. If you push the, 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 uh, this piston, and if you know the dimensions of the ball, and if you know the, you know the, the, uh, the, what fluid is inside, then you can make this kind of resonant pumping. Then you can observe with these instruments very strong moving inside of this. You know. Similar things happen with electricity. So he said, if I put in one point of the earth some kind of electrical pump and reasonably push the electricity to the ground, you know, I will make stationary waves. It will not be creating of a new energy. I will just transform this static electricity inside of the ground into kind of dynamic, very rigid, you know, uh, form of conducting, actually. So he was talking about wireless transmitting, not of what some kind of producing. It was not perpetuum mobile. This is just the technology for transmitting energy from the one part of the globe to another par part of the globe without wires. So it was 1899. I must remind you that in 1899, it was just three or four years that first current, electrical current, alternate, passed from Niagara Falls to New York. First automobiles appeared in the street of, on the street of New York. Uh, first airplane didn't fly. Uh, rich uh, houses didn't have a sterilized water inside. Uh, whole planet Earth looking from the space was in dark. Can you, can you imagine what this guy was talking about at the time when we are living almost in the dark? So it was really technology, technology of, uh, you know, uh, future. And he was uh, uh, really believed that, that uh, in, uh, this technology, which may, uh, will, will make a social a revolution, actually. This was the main Tesla's idea. So he was financed by J.P. Morgan, and uh, uh, he developed this kind of activity, but stopped by Italian Marconi. <laughs> yeah. So um, I will finish with this, and uh, I just want to tell you that uh, that uh, uh, I didn't have a big ambition with this talk, you know, to. Uh, to, to give some answers to, to this topic. I just want maybe to inspire some of you to, to join us and to then to discuss together with us uh, about the Leonardo and Tesla in the context of the Soros. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you both very much for this, uh, for our academic context, a little bit unusual, uh, but uh, very um, interesting and inspiring talks. Uh, so, uh, no doubt that uh, Tes Tesla and Da Vinci are par excellence examples for today's topic, especially when speaking about vision, about self-reflection on the one's subconscious creative process, about the innovation, about going far beyond the possible and the real. So, th this is the reason why Alexander and Branimir thought of putting Tesla and Da Vinci in a juxtaposition, not to make a potentially banal parallel between them, absolutely not, but to investigate the similar processes of their thinking, inventing and producing patents. Their lives were five centuries uh, distant. One was an engineer, the other one was an artist. One could only imagine flying machines, the other one lived in the time of real ones. One actually could use the other one as an inspiration. So uh, I would like to open up a discussion now um, our discussants today, I would like uh, Snezhan and JP if they could maybe join us here. Um, our discussants today are either employed at uh, our institute or are closely collaborating with us. Uh, so we have architects Snezhana Vesnic, uh, Marko Ristic and our Eresh, and uh, two philosophers, uh, Aleksandar Ostovic and Željko Radinković with us. So maybe uh, if you agree, I would start with uh, Željko. Uh, who will put uh, the question of intu intuitionism in the wider context of philosophy and technology, reflecting on um, his book, actually, that is uh, uh, about to be published in a few days. So I think that uh, he can add um, another perspective for our discussion.
discussion. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> no, not at all. Not, not a single word. So <laughs> it's just, uh, just a trick. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will talk uh, about technology as uh, the art of possible, in the meaning uh, of art as umiece. Uh, that means mostly uh, skills or, or some skillful uh, acting or something. Um, I will deviate a little from your lectures and try to place the question of intu intuitionism uh, and the question, and also the question of ingenious inventiveness in the context of reflection of the essential mediation of technical action and the invention of technical means. It is some kind of general reflection of the categories as a mediation tool or intuition. I would now like to make a few remarks for the, uh, on the question of the concept of intuition in philosophy, particularly in the context of phenomenology. It was Edmund Husserl who, based on his theoretical background in mathematical intuition, uh, designed the concept of categorical intuition. It is the idea of direct and holistic understanding of a phenomenon. This idea differs from the constructivist theoretical approach, uh, for example, in Immanuel Kant's Transcendental Philosophy, in which it is assumed that there is a set of categories or, and forms, such as um, causality, substance, time, space, etc., on the basis of which one constructs the object of knowledge. This means that with regard to Husserl's intuitionism, we can speak of a direct grasping of the object of knowledge, while in Kant's constructivism, constructivist approach, it is a categorically mediate, mediated act of knowledge. There's some one concept is a uh, concept of uh, um, uh, immediate uh, grasping of, of objects of knowledge, one is immediate. Mm -hmm. uh, this question of cognitive process as an essentially mediated one place, uh, as, a, as an essentially mediated one plays a particularly important role when it comes to technical inventions. It is the philosophy of technology in the philosophy of technology, the structure of technical judgment is understood as so-called abductive logical conclusion. In, con in contrast to deductive and inductive logical reasoning, abductive reasoning is based on the result of the technical action and a concrete case of this action. In order to then come to a conclusion about the general rule on the basis of such premises. A simple example, if we use a knife to cut a piece of bread, then knowledge of general uh, usefulness of that tool arises from the result of, it use, of its use. When cutting bread, we notice that this or that property of the knife is not optimal for the fulfillment of this purpose. It can is a process of optimization, basically, on, on, in every technical judgment, uh, I think, is process of optimization. Um, that means uh, technical judgment is essentially learning by doing. In order to grasp it and anthropological, genealogical, um, anthropological uh, way, I would like to point out the difference between the magical and the technical practice of shaping the world. Magical practice, practice consists essentially in the increase of intensification or intensification of the desire for the realization of a concrete goal. 
Primarily, no suitable tools for the realization are sought or designed, but the realization is anticipated in a predicted ritual. For example, in a ritual that precedes the hunt, the act of the hunt is performed, is performed in advance as if it were the act itself. It is not technically uh, um, a judgment. They uh, make this act in advance. For example, uh -huh, okay. um, its success is realized and secured in advance, so to speak. It is only important to carry out this ritual and as intensively as possible. Okay. And magical practice is therefore an essentially unmediated practice. In contrast, technical action, but also the invention of the technical tools, has the structure of the action in general. This means that it is a matter of finding the right tools or means for purposes that are understood to be achievable. Okay. Um, okay. It, it, um, I have some uh, uh, have a few notices, but uh, I think it uh, will be enough uh, now. Um, only one. Um, I would like to point out an interesting notion of uh, te uh, technically mediated imme technically me mediated immediacy. Uh, immediacy. We find it in Marshall McLuhan's view of the so-called electronic age, but also uh, in a telematic society, so-called telematic society of William Fusser. Namely, the new electronic media will enable all bodily and conscious functions to be holistically represented by technology. It's uh, some kind of uh, um, new, uh, uh, um, can I say, the, the, um, basically uh, essentially mediated acting as technology acting results in some uh, uh, kind of state of uh, unmediately. Uh, we can act uh, without tools. We are the tools. We are the technology. The technology is our subconscious. Uh, subconscious now. This is the electronic age of technology. So, thank you. Thank you, Željko, very much for your contribution. Uh, we're looking forward to reading your book. Uh, so, who would uh, like to, to continue? OK. Thank you both. Uh, I, I learned a lot that I didn't knew. And uh, thank you. And uh, somehow it all uh, uh, gathered in, in one holistic picture. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad that you uh, mentioned the names of Tesla's inventions. Uh, the names in which he te tells us that those are arts, art of um, art of this, art of that, and, and uh, etc. Uh, I read um, my brother, who doctor, wrote PhD on Tesla, uh, gave me some books. Uh, the the problem of an sorry for my translation. The problem of uh, enlarging human energy. The problem increasing of, of capacity of human energy. So the, 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 this and other book, Tesla not once mentioned the word technology or technicity itself. And I think it would be a rather interesting and, and to see what Leonardo <coughs> words are using and to, to have some comparative analysis and to see which words are missing and why are they missing. So th this cannot be accidents. To have in 100 pages not one word of technology <coughs> isn't, uh, isn't uh, an accident. So why th does art is, is, is there for, for technology? And uh, when we talk about uh, Alessandro, you, you mentioned that, uh, that we, can, we can judge uh, on, on the fiction, fictional character 
the history of science will judge whether yeah. what is what is was fiction or what wasn't. But the, the that means that future is a judgment, and future is a judge is a judge. How can we tell what is itself fictional and what is not? That that is the question that Leibniz and and many other before Leibniz in Renaissance uh, talked about, and it is present today. Uh, I mean, if we look at uh, at the Faraday, if we look at if, at uh, uh, Feynman, if, uh, the things that one that were unimaginable, that was fictional in one step of the time, in another moment, those are realism, scientific realism, and it was uh, and it was fictional to the to the whole point. And I, I will uh, somehow uh, bring Jelko into this discussion with with his question. Uh, um, when you mentioned uh, the distinction between magic and and uh, technology, uh, you said that uh, what is mediated and what is not. But if we if we look at the magic from the Renaissance point of view, the, the authors such as uh, John Dee, Ficino, Pico, Bruno would say that magic is uh, seeing, seeing, observing, unseeable causal relations inside the nature and the scientific is observing see seeable but the unseeable can become seeable so if they talk about uh, the astral energy that they are meditating and using it for a different purpose and if astral energy in a, another uh, in another period of time tesla becomes a real energy or a magnetic field of something that is ether then then uh, what, how there isn't a, don't you think there is not a clear line between the definition of magical and renaissance and the definition of scientific today because this is and, and fictional what is fictional and what is not so so one can uh, can be uh, really really fast transferred to another there isn't such a like this we don't we will not talk about because it's, it isn't a scientific idea whatever scientific is is meant by that and this and this is so, so I have a lot more, but I will uh, I will stop here. Yes, of course. Uh, well, th this is kind of really interesting for uh, for us who study Renaissance because late Renaissance is uh, is a milestone in, in history because you know um, here comes Galileo Galilei with his scientific method, and this is uh, this is a game change because what is not measurable is not real for scientific method. But, but this is not the whole story, of course. <coughs> um, in Leonardo, uh, well, Leonardo uh, has, even, if, even when he tries to act as, a, as, a, as an engineer, he, he has an artistic mind in some way. And it's very <coughs> interesting what you were telling about art as a higher level of skills because you know um, the vast majority of uh, uh, renaissance engineers were also artists the vast majority um, francesco di giorgio martini is an engineer and architect he built uh, uh, some of the most beautiful fortresses of the italian renaissance and he is also he is also a painter he, he does incredibly frescoes and, and so on so it, it's the it's really something which uh, has to do with skills and skills are all, all rounders and it's also it's just later in uh, well uh, the end of the 16th and uh, the start of the 17th century in which this uh, um, this goes into some kind of separation of, uh, uh, of skills and um, when you were talking about the, the mediated and the immediate uh, uh, Kind of reason or reasoning on, on, uh, on technology about real things in general. Um, Leonardo has, has a really a nice picture of this. Uh, he tells that uh, getting acquainted with some kind of uh, a skill is like uh, uh, learning to walk for a baby. Uh, you don't know exactly how you do this, uh, but you're um, rationally trying to do something you grab something to get up and uh, so you you want to do this but you don't know exactly how you do this and the moment in which you start walking it's kind of magic so uh this is this is really nice and the the iterative uh process of refining something 
which can be mediated or mediate in the, the way you were talking about. Also, this is something that goes beyond the rationality because also you know, try to think to something very, very technical. Uh, when you try to refine an industrial process, when you are very advanced in this, you, you don't uh, go through all the passages every time you try to refine something. You, you, you think just that th this is what you already know and you don't have the need to uh, go through all the passages every time. So it's something like a, 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 a knowledge that's uh, uh, acquired. And so uh, even this in some very weird way is something that goes beyond the, just the rationality of the of a, uh, engineering process. Well, it's a bit of a stretch to this, but anyway. Um, and uh, oh, uh, it, it was very inspiring your, uh, your quote of uh, the observation of clouds in Tesla. Clouds uh, for Leonardo are absolutely inspiring. You know, the, the really strong images of the uh, universal delusion uh, in Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, um, in many of these drawings, there are notes, small notes, and he uh, writes down what he observed of uh, the transformation of these clouds uh, from some kind of uh, shapes into another, and how light passes through this. Uh, and, and this is very rational, and then approaches to something which is complete art, which is these incredibly drawings of the disasters and delusions. And, so it's uh, really mixed, uh, and, and Leonardo is, is emblematic in this, uh, and uh, it's maybe unique, but it's not the only one who acts like this, especially in Renaissance. I just remember something. Can I, yeah, can no, I no, ask, no, ask no. one more? Uh, don't you think that based on your presentation and, and uh, the both of yours presentation, the, the word where we can connect Tesla and, and, uh, and uh, Leonardo is holism, because uh, they both are, are um, they both are providing a holistic uh, view of the world, because what will be uh, um, introduced in science during the 20th century via structuralism is that analogy will stop to be the, the mother of all stupidity, as for Aristotle, but it will be legitimate to see, aha, I see how the bird is flying. I can try, I can try to, to catch, not, I can try to catch some of the laws inside one system and transplant it into another system. So if there is a law in nature and the law how the electric is, cir uh, is circling through the ground, then maybe I can find and gather that, that laws from one structure and transplant it into, in, into another structure. They both are, are uh, I, I read some uh, really interesting analogies with, which can be um, proved. I mean, those are, um, even if the um, content is, uh, at first sight is uh, really different it can be uh, th there are some of uh, some of clues uh, inside of inside of yes, can i say of course, of you, course. when you are saying this uh, what comes to my mind the first passage i, I uh, uh, read it to you this julian hawthorne so what said julian hawthorne at the end uh, 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 he said your whole work is a poetry let's say your whole work is art but it differs from what goes under the name of art in being winged with actual a certain fact, not a mere hope of coming mastery of nature, but certainty of it, you know. This is, so we, we have to differ, you know. For example, we have the Gilles Verne has a fictional, you know, prediction of what happened and a lot of things happened actually, you know. What's the difference between the art and the science in that sense, you know. So this is that uh, science possessed some kind of power to predict things which will happen, you know. But uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the connection with what you said, the holistic approach for what uh, Leonardo and Tesla, uh, also uh, comes to my mind, Tesla's words uh, at the end of his uh, you know, career when he was very old, and he was a little bit uh, bitter, you know. He, was, he didn't like what's happening in, the, in uh, our modern civilization. Uh, he said, old uh, scientists of the past, like Franklin and Morse, think clearly. Modern scientists think deeply. You know what is the difference between thinking clearly and deeply? So I believe that 
artists think all the time clearly, you know, but scientists uh, of uh, last time think deeply. What does it mean? This is different between uh, climbing and uh, hiking and the, and the digging. What are the modern scientists? Part of the teams, they are digging and going deeper, deeper into the holes and pulling out of the holes treasures, you know. But from the hole, you can see skies like this, you know. But old scientists were climbing to the mountains to see the perspective, you know, and also was able to, to go deeply, you know. This is the difference. So I believe you are right. And it's an interesting context for both of us to, to discuss later how we can put Leonardo and yeah. you know how we can, we can connect these, these times and these things. And also I would like to mention again that uh, uh, for me it's interesting, you know, this analysis of Greek terms and that these, uh, I read somewhere, this is not, uh, I, you know, it, uh, I read somewhere that uh, traces of Aristotle method can be found in late 19th century. I believe uh, in Tesla's case too. And Tesla was not the only one who wrote at that time the art of this and the art of that. It was kind of usual approach, you know, that art and science was not so separated like today's, you know. Yes, this, uh, this reflection on the holism is very interesting because Leonardo explicitly refuses to be holistic. He, he says he wants to dissect things, and uh, but when he acts, uh, he's holistic. Uh, is yeah, it, I know. Is it a total contradiction yeah, in this? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, so uh, it's... Uh, Thank you. And, oh, sorry. No, no, no. Um, the, this parallel between the two, between Leonardo and, uh, and Tesla, is, is very improper of course, historically speaking. But I can help uh, to find analogies in, uh, in many, many things. Uh, so, uh, well, who is acquainted with the matter can do this uh, without, the, the, uh, without being misunderstood, but we have, we have to be very careful, of course. And also, also the biographies are in some way uh, incredibly similar because they, they go abroad to, to be able to work and they fail in the... Uh, their masterpiece, the big sculpture for Leonardo and uh, the transmission of energy. So there, there are many, many links between the two it is, it, at, so, at so great distance, uh, which of course we, we have to take into account every time we speak of, of the boat. But uh, well, it's, it's really fascinating for me. It's really stimulating. OK, I'm glad. Snežana, uh, Marko, Davor, any uh, Thoughts from uh, architectural perspective? Maybe Dara or Mark, but I will be at the end because I'm looking for this title. And uh -huh. to explain the title. Okay, so we will leave Snezhana so, for the possible conclusion. Okay, uh, I will try to be brief. Uh, I think that my question uh, is related to what you have said. Uh, and the question is, uh, how do inventors dream, or maybe um, uh, do they dream or do they daydream? Um, uh, I, I, I would like to ask, like, um, what is the role of consciousness in the dreams of inventors? Uh, Jericho uh, has mentioned the phrase, the art of the possible. So uh, me as an architect, I'm always interested in, um, uh, I could say, the physics of dreams, like how do dreams, uh, how dreams could become possible uh, in any way. Uh, Mr. Ivanovic said, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the difference between thinking clearly uh, and deeply. Um, so maybe that would be another metaphor for what, what I'm interested in. Thank you, Marco. Very philosophical question for an, from an architect. Um, uh, um, uh, the the is the the is the 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 izumitelja, dakle, um, na koji način se to razlikuje od uh, materializma kao čisto onoga što vi zovete uh, think clearly. Uh, dakle, 
koju ulogu igra, igra znanje, koja je ta epistemološka funkcija snova, a, odnosno kao hajde fikcije. Ovi, a, da ga, a, vi ste pomenuli a, on je jedan citat a, gde Tesla kaže ja želim da zamislim nešto kao, ja već zamišljam nešto kao realno u, u sumu. To je, to je pitanje. Ko, kako, kak, a, koji je nivo realnosti fikcije nekog? Taj odnos između realnosti i fikcije u njegovoj metodi, ili to oblik to? to uh, uh, ok, so, uh, uh, in, in Tesla's case, uh, you know, as I mentioned uh, just before, you know, this is the difference between the science and the art, you know, because uh, uh, in his uh, method he was focused on something uh, which is... Uh, uh, which is the beginning of the process, you know, or 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 or, or maybe I can say that uh, his uh, 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 that's I didn't mention. It's very important. He said at the beginning of his uh, creative process, he had the feeling, you know, he had kind of intuition, you know. He don't have some fact, you know, that has some. He observes something and then he starts to think about. It. He had some feeling about something, you know, and uh, for example. Uh, when he was a young man, he was 22 years old, you know, uh, when he, or, yes, 21, 22, when he was listening, his professor was talking about uh, uh, generators of that time which produce electricity. And he said that uh, science uh, uh, say that, uh, says that uh, it is not possible to use alternating currents and to pro produce uh, uh, some kind of moving in the motor. You know? It was the state of the science, you know. But Tesla stood up at that time, he was just a student, you know, and say, I believe it's possible. You know? And then the professor stopped, you know, ever, ever said, just a moment. But Tesla was famous as a young man. They know, they knew that he was a genius. Uh, and he said, uh, you, will, you will achieve fantastic things, you know, but you never build this. You know? It is not possible, simply, science said. And Tesla started to, 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 to develop this method, you know, for five years, you know. So the, the, the relationship between the something which is fictional, but something which is rooted in kind of uh, intuition and feeling, you know, you know, and something which, which, uh, which, uh, which appear to be realist, which actually changed the world, you know. Uh, just to tell you one very interesting thing, that uh, something which uh, 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 began with the, with the feeling, with intuition, ended with eight billion dollars invested american industry invested in in tesla's patents 36 patents it was uh, 20 years later you know so it's very fantastic example of uh, you know uh, uh, relationship with uh, fictional and realistic you know it's a good good example of a uh, title of this uh, workshop you know technologies fictional surrealism and sorry, if I remember well from your book, it's very interesting the moment in, we, in which he comes up with his idea. He was yeah, walking, yeah, he, you, can, you, yeah. you, you can tell this, it's very interesting. You mind. mean when he... Uh, yeah, in the park. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah. He was, he was quoting a poem from uh, Goethe's Faust, you know? <laughs> and it was kind of, uh, you know, some kind of... Uh, Overlapping. Overlapping, you know? Uh, it was, uh, some was coming down. And he was the quoting passage from the Faust, which is uh, talking about the sunset. You know? And at that time, something happened, you know. And he was so excited. He so perfect flashes, you know. Just, just images and transfer into the drawings later on, you know. So this moment uh, reminds me of another moment in the movie, in the movie uh, uh, Amadeus of Miloš Forman, you know. This is the moment when, when Salieri is approaching to a desk on which there are a uh, piece of papers on which Mozart wrote uh, some symphony or I don't know what. And Salieri was watching, no, no, no mistake, everything was written, you know. And he said, it is impossible. How it is possible to, to, to write down something so perfect without any, you know, change. It's something impossible. But this is this is this this kind of external forces which we do not control you know this is something which coming to i'm not sure that i answered your question you know but uh, well in my opinion this is something like a dream 
step up. So exactly. tall. Uh, Davor, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Thank you once more for, for the lecture and for these two, uh, Sanya, you for inviting all of us and putting these two super, I think, interesting, intriguing figures together. And regarding that, uh, maybe I will just uh, more would like to, to put a comment. Maybe it's consultation. I don't know what, if you can build up some comment on, on that. But for me to put Tesla and, and uh, Leonardo together. Uh, what was very interesting for me from this post-human theory, which is kind of very actual today, is that, uh, you know, like Le Leonardo was famous about his uh, drawing of, uh, of uh, Vitruvian man, yeah. which is actually through this drawing, he constructs this idea of humanity, basically. Which, which, which is actually this, this drawing is humanism, where, where this humanism is visualized through the drawing. And then we have Tesla who, who constructed this. He, he was one of the first event, inventor of, let's say, the robot or robotic, or let, let's say that, that's maybe one of, of the field that he was very, uh, he was pi pioneer in, in this kind of, if I, I could maybe say it. So he is maybe the, the, the first uh, person who maybe constructed this post-human uh, possibility, let's say, to be real, not just to, to imagine, to invent, to, but maybe he is the one who, who really uh, stabbed this starting point, point for that. So for me, there is this, uh, connection be between Leonardo constructing this humanism in a way and then Tesla start starting this the whole new era wh which is not just imagining uh, machines and robots but really being into that so for, for me these two personalities uh, as a construct con uh, to, to construct, to invent, not only to invent, but, but to really uh, produce it. For me, that's, that's kind of uh, interesting. Um, from this point of, let, let's say, post-humanism. Um, and then uh, you, I, I think you uh, quoted or, or mentioned this um, Tesla in relation um, the change uh, of the appearance of the world. So it's not just to, to uh, solve the problem, to, to construct, to invent, but to change. And now I'm, I think, talking as an architect, as practitioner more than philosopher, but architect who is practicing, practice, practicing architecture. So we as an architect, we are obsess obsessed exactly by this, by to change the appearance of the world. And I think that there was some point of time where architecture was really, how to say, shaping and, and have this kind of monopole to, to shape the world by the architecture, by, by the, let's say, the building, by the building. But from one point, I think the science took this advantage. And I think it's looked like that these two person have these key, key points. For, for me, like Tesla is the person who, who with his invention, change this position and uh, change the appearance of the world because his uh, in invention changed the world. He actually constructed the world that we are living now. It's not the... the as a generation, but... <laughs> yeah, I want... To, uh, my generation are, are made with a purpose, just just to, to, to think, to debate about the position of architect and position of scientist and this invention which can connect them and this kind of ambitions to change the appearance. So I'm, I'm talking about appearance. Technology which is shaping the appearance. It's not just the invention as mechanical things, but really e even, even I think the science and technology, architecture today is just following technology. It's not like we are, advance and that we are shaping our kind of 
Okay, th these are maybe two uh, two two points that maybe thank we can you, put thank you to... very much. I mean, it's very interesting that you, both you and Alexander, gave uh, uh, your inputs on the possible connections between these two two characters, which I think that uh, might be useful for uh, Alexander and uh, Branimir if they decide to continue with their collaboration, potential exhibition. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Uh, Would you like to? One, one Absolutely, one. yes. Uh, I just tell you. Uh, when I say exaggeration, sorry, I didn't I mean. <laughs> I, I think I, I done it purposely, unconsciously, but I think they are. You know, uh, just to explain to, to, to Alex and mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to look at it, we serves uh, some, sometimes, you know, want to take <laughs> test like, you know, <laughs> discover everything. But, but uh, really, what, what are the facts actually mm -hmm. about this, what you said? He changed the world. And, you know, it's really, I found it in uh, one uh, uh, Kurt process, which, in which Tesla was witness, you know, mm -hmm. he claimed that these eight billion dollars of that time, which if we transfer to today's money, it's, it's about two hundred and forty billion dollars, which was invested, industry invested into into it, it was invested into into the industry based on Tesla's patents, you know, but it really changed the, uh, the the face of America at that time. This this is the fact. But if we are talking about this wireless transmission of energy, you know, this is he saw this transition, this social revolution that we have, this change, as you said. But this change came lately based on other technologies. You know, some of them were related to Tesla, some of them wireless transmission of signals, for example. He invented actually this four tune circuit system, which is in the basis of our uh, communicating device. Mm -hmm. His wireless transmission of energy system was never realized so far, you know. But uh, the difference between the polyphase system and wireless transmission this was realized, actually materialized, you know, and this was, uh, you know, he saw what happened and it really happened, but based on, okay, different than uh, other technologies. And uh, this moment, you know, is so exciting. When he saw this change, you know, he, he was on the, on the you know, uh, uh, he saw the possibility to himself to, 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 to contribute, you know, but he was stopped at the time. And later on, after 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, we saw mm. this. Regarding your, uh, regarding your uh, mentioning uh, uh, Leonardo's famous man, which represent the era of humanity, you know, and Tesla's robotics, uh, his uh, wireless uh, distance control boats, which he demonstrated in 1898, which, with which he maybe uh, announced the era of artificial intelligence which is now, you know, very, very actual. That can be maybe some point we can discuss later on about this. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to add something about this idea of changing the world. Mm. Because uh, in, in Renaissance... Appearance it, of the world. The appearance, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, in, in Renaissance, it was a bit too early to think to something so definitive as cha changing the appearance of the world. The world was so big and man was so small. And there are nice examples in, in Leonardo, in which um, I was asked some years ago uh, about uh, uh, what Leonardo thought about uh, the, uh, the relation between uh, uh, cities, towns and nature. In, uh, in a modern way, uh, and now we are talking about sustainability and uh, the conservation of the environment. At the time, the problem was exactly the opposite. They, they had to, uh, to, 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 to make defenses from, uh, from the, 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 the nature to, to eat the cities, the towns. So it was exactly the opposite. But nevertheless, this is the time in which, uh, for example, uh, it, it's... Uh, get born the idea of the ideal city, which is something very, uh, very interesting because uh, you do not, uh, you start thinking not to a city as just a, just a position of buildings one against another, but you have to think about a structured way of uh, the utilization of the soil uh, because uh, things are starting not to work exactly as they are intended to be. And uh, so, uh, Leonardo on this uh, has many incredible ideas, not uh, unrealistic for the time, of course, uh, as usual. But um, as a dream, this is coming to come up with minds to, to people at the time. So it's, it's, uh, it's a nice point. And, uh, and I, I would like to steal a quote from Tesla about the general thing, uh, the, the, which
which uh, Branham will give to me. This is this. The scientific man does not aim at an immediate result. He does not expect that his advanced ideas will be readily taken up. His work is like that of a planter for the future. His duty is to lay the foundation of those who are to come and point the way. So this is really, is the complete consciousness of his role in society, no? Thank you. Uh, Snežana, would you like, uh, Snežana, the author of the uh, today's topic, uh, would you like to give a uh, contribution? Thank you so much. Uh, we uh, had yesterday uh, at Faculty of Architecture in Belgrade uh, two very interesting lectures from uh, Luca and Alexander, and, and I think that somehow it was introduction to this day, um, because I, I want to explain how we meet that this title of the, of the seminar. Uh, to be honest, um, when uh, Sanya told us to our laboratory, Perspect Lab, um, about your connection and uh, uh, she uh, yeah. wanted to make so something connected uh, with both of you and Tesla and Da Vinci, uh, all of us um, uh, were so skeptical. And we discussed a lot how to make that connection to be able to, to, to make some uh, some title and some uh, some seminar, and I uh, thought a lot, and I found that um, uh, common ground, common <coughs> thing for technology, uh, for uh, science and art uh, is technology. And um, uh, the other thing, uh, to be honest, I didn't know that uh, um, Leonardo and Tesla are connected with surrealism, with fiction. Uh, but I started with the technology, my, with my opinion as, as architect, like uh, technology uh, must be fictional. And uh, in that method, I, I put uh, real as a realization, because you, uh, in my opinion, Tesla and Leonardo um, uh, invent some kind of, of the real. Maybe some philosophers mm. uh, will be... Uh, contrary on, on my thesis because, but I made this decision between the real and the real, uh, reality. So I put um, the real in connected to uh, fiction because um, uh, if we, uh, we are able to explain uh, fiction as a report paradox, we, we can see that in fiction there are a strict part of reality. So I made uh, fiction and reality in the same line but uh, uh, when I um, try to read what Tesla really uh, did and uh, Leonardo connected to architectural concept, I, I, I put that sore, like the position to be free, to be very creative in producing a concept. Actually, my, my um, uh, intention was to ask uh, one question. Um, are we able still to make uh, new concepts? And if we are able to make new concepts, um, um, uh, will we must first make new concepts of technology to be able to produce a new architecture concept? Um, so I find in Tesla and Leonardo that um, uh, in my opinion, um, both of them are artistic artist, but somehow, uh, like an architect, uh, try to invent new concepts with the new technology. So it was uh, the, the story of the, uh, this title. And uh, um, now I think that uh, I, I was true, that all connection uh, between Leonardo and Tesla are, um, how to say, um, are on the question if we try to, to connect, uh, maybe historically speaking, maybe on holistic way, etc. But uh, in my opinion, Tesla and Leonardo try to invent something completely new. Mm. Uh, so uh, basically speaking, for me, uh, that approach to technology, that technology must be always new, always find new concepts, because we know that method is repeatable, because of that method, it, it is never new. So, um, okay, 
that's my comment and the question for you, are we able to produce something new and how we will be able to produce something new? Maybe, uh, can I make a short yeah. comment? Uh, maybe some other time. Uh, we can uh, make another workshop. Uh, uh, the, the last 10, 15 years I was uh, 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 dealing with something we call Tesla doctrine. So Tesla, uh, you know, when he uh, didn't uh, succeed with this wireless uh, transfer of energy system, you know, he was uh, first uh, financed by J.P. Morgan. Then J.P. Morgan stopped financing. No one wants to finance Tesla anymore, you know. So he was shocked. He asked himself, why? If I have something so good for the humanity, why they don't want to, you know? But the reasons are very, very simple, you know. J.P. Morgan, you know, some uh, six or seven years ago, financed Niagara Falls power system. They put the millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into the system of transmission of energy through the wires. And Tesla came five years later and said, I have the system without wires. So he didn't understand, you know, the concept of the business of the capitalism, you know, at that time. But uh, he was shocked and uh, he realized that uh, interests, uh, material interests uh, prevail, you know, that, that they did, those people have no ideals, you know. So he started to, 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 uh, to, to uh, try to understand in what direction humanity will go, civilization will go. So after some time, uh, he was asked by the, the journalist, uh, what uh, did he think about, uh, uh, about uh, what does he think about uh, uh, the, the modern civilization, which he contributes so much with his polyphase system, you know. And he said uh, something very, very, which is related to what you said, you know. Uh, he said, this civilization uh, has technology with uh, nothing similar appears in the past, you know. We, we witnessed something fantastic, you know. But uh, this technology is helping us to live better in the sense of safety of existence and commodity of existence. But these technology are not leading us to, into direction of true culture and true enlightenment. On the contrary, it is destructive on the ideals. If, and if it continues to develop in this uh, direction, it will disappear like many other big civilizations. So it will go into instability. We are witnessing the stability of this civilization. Why, they ask? Because this civilization tried to solve the material problem only in order to be stable, to be true sustainable in the long term, you know, it should solve a uh, spiritual problem, moral problem too, you know. So this was the vision. This question, what kind of technology we need, you know, actually we need kind of balance between the technology. This is the balance between the realistic and fantastic, the balance between the, the, the uh, 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 science and the art, you know, balance with uh, our material aims and our ideals. This was how Tesla looked this kind of, uh, or he at least gave, uh, gave the, tried to give the answer to, to these kind of questions we have now today, you know, he had a uh, hundred years ago. Yes, and in general, uh, this is not strictly connected to Leonardo, but uh, I think that uh, nowadays uh, uh, things has become a, a, a lot more complex at the time of Leonardo. So, um, one man band creativity is not more, this is not more the time for, for geniuses like Leonardo to go. We, we have this funny, let's say so, character of Elon Musk. You know, he's a nowadays genius, but he just came up with some weird idea and 90% uh, of the times it's just trash. And uh, sometimes some smart engineer says, oh, okay, we can try to do something. So it, it's much more complex. Uh, and at the time it was so simpler that uh, men like Leonardo, Michelangelo uh, could do really great, great things that maybe nowadays are not longer possible. E even great uh, architects like uh, Zad, Idor, uh, I can mention both of them. Uh, they have really genius ideas, but they work in large teams, and this is the only way they could go with, through the ideas. So it, it's really different. Uh, I wanted to just to give a comment. Uh, uh, I was also, on the other hand, I was skeptic when you when you proposed the title because I was thinking like how to put what three of us were talking about before in this context. But actually now, after these uh, talks, I realized that uh, I think that we actually 
triggered with, with your title, we triggered uh, new new ideas mm -hmm. and new perspectives um, that I hopefully I hope that it might be useful for for your collaboration. So actually, it's it's uh, I think that we we succeeded and thanks for your title. Yeah, it's really um, a nice start. Yeah. So uh, does anyone maybe uh, from the audience have any comment or uh, question? Yes, please. Yes, uh, we, we just need the, oh, to give because it's real. Ah, okay. Thank yes. you. Um, so I was interested, intrigued by the earlier conversation about holism. I'm a sociologist, so that's kind of more of an epistemological or a philosophical frame. But for me, what's tying these two talks together is a certain kind of nostalgia for a period when there wasn't. So it's kind of this Habermasian story of modernity as hyper-specialization, the breaking apart of every field of human endeavor, intellectual endeavor, into these more and more narrow slices, which I hate because I'm a theorist. And I like to kind of combine things together. And even in reading your journal, I see a lot of kind of multidisciplinarity here. Um, but that's, it's, you know, Max Weber talked about the iron cage. Basically, the technological innovations that figures like this were responsible for brought about a world of hyper-efficiency that's kind of that, that produces this kind of inescapable specialization where they, they brought about a world in which they made figures like themselves obsolete, basically. Um, so I wonder if maybe you two could briefly comment about this, because I, I see this as a nostalgia for a period when science, technology, art were really part of a unified domain of human intellectual endeavor, one that for, for us now is very much out of date, something in the past. Well, uh, so uh, but, um, I, I think this, in some ways, uh, it's again related to to the general to the general uh, state of uh, uh, yes, science, technology, and, and society how they combine in in, 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 a, in an environment which changes in time and history, and so. Uh, I think this, this this is worth something really really deeper. I, it, um, every time I reflect on, on themes like this, I, I go through what uh, Branimir was saying about technology that nowadays uh, digs uh, deep holes uh, and sees just uh, a really small uh, portion of the sky. This is exactly what we are going through these times, and uh, and so minds like uh, uh, like Leonardo and and, and other I. I I'm convinced that, well, the nice question uh, I, I was posed many times and I, I pose myself too is what, what would have been Leonardo nowadays? In my opinion, nothing. Because he's a total alien uh, in respect of how today we come up with new ideas or how technology is. He's a total artist. At the time, it was possible for a, a mind like him to, to go through technology too. But nowadays, uh, uh, maybe, maybe he would have been uh, a theater author, or I don't know exactly, but nothing, nothing really related to, uh, to what we know about Leonardo, I think. Thank you. Did you want to say something? Can just interrupt for a second? Yeah. The, 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 we can be kind of skeptical about it, these claims because yeah. the, the, the uh, it's just my opinion, uh, no, no, <laughs> of course. The, the, the philosophy of science that shows us that, uh, that what is hypothesis? Thank you. What is hypothesis? Is, uh, doesn't matter if it's fictional art or whatever. If it has good prediction and it has some logical consistency, then it doesn't matter if it uh, even came from a myth. It, it will be, if, if Leonardo still be an artist and uh, he, he think whatever he does, but if those claims have some valuable predictions, then then it would be relevant for 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 science. If those, it doesn't matter if he's yeah. into the technology or not. The only problem that and it comes to your question too: what, what, creating of a real is today a question of uh, conventionalism. The real must be in science accepted as real by the whole of science, and that is uh, what is called a scientific paradigm. It, in uh, other way, uh, other way, we must wait for a paradigm to change, and then what wasn't real will become real. So the, the, it's it is not alone on scientists to create real; it's all on the whole 
scientific community to accept that as a real and pronounce a new method or a new paradigm that will be that will be supporting that this new real that is created. Well, the thing is, in my opinion, that um, if Leonardo lived uh, nowadays, uh, to be believable, for example, uh, as a scientist, uh, he, he should have to, to be a scientist. So he should have studied science. And it's so complex uh, nowadays that uh, he should have killed his other parts of his soul in some way. So I don't think it would have been the same kind of genius we are used to think about. I hope so. But it's just my opinion. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Who knows? Would you don't know much about all that? <laughs> no, of course. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, okay, that's it. I think that uh, we can then finish. Uh, thanks again a lot for your uh, talks and uh, thanks everyone for your contribution. And um, that's it. Yeah, see you soon, hopefully. In, in Vinci, in yeah, Tuscany, or in. Uh, Whenever Tuscany. you want, yeah. of course, you're welcome. I think that we should organize something in Vinci, definitely. <laughs> okay. Thank you.